The rain provided our firefighters a chance to breathe, but we are still far from being in the clear. Wildfire activity has been exacerbated by the severe drought that we're experiencing across the province. 27 out of 34 drought basins are currently at level four or level five, with level five being the most severe. While a handful of basins have ticked down a step, we have not experienced anywhere near the rainfall needed to see those levels come down in a significant way. And in the northern part of the province, they didn't see nearly the same level of rain as the southern and coastal regions. The northeastern regions are expected to continue to see unseasonably warm temperatures, smoke, and strong winds. This has led to previously in control fires becoming out of control again and could lead to more extreme fire behavior. With these factors in mind, and on the advice of emergency management wildfire officials, I am extending the provincial state of emergency for an additional two weeks in case additional extraordinary powers to issue orders under the Emergency Program Act are required to respond. The nature and unpredictability of the wildfires that we are experiencing this year means that we all need to remain vigilant. We will continue to assess the situation and respond and adapt as needed. Next week, students will be returning to schools throughout BC. For some families though, the start of school won't be the same. Currently, there are two public schools in areas under evacuation order, and there are 14 public schools and three independent schools under evacuation alert. My colleagues in the Ministry of Emergency, oh, pardon me, that's me. My colleagues in the Ministry of Education and Child Care are working closely with all wildfire impacted school districts to ensure that they have alternate plans for each of their students should their school not be able to open. This may involve supporting students to start school in a neighboring district, moving schools to another building to start their learning, or moving to online learning through one of the provincial online schools. The province is supporting school districts to ensure students, teachers, and staff are getting the supports that they need to cope with the impacts of the wildfires. For example, the North Okanagan Shushwap School District is providing additional counseling services for students, teachers, and staff, recognizing that some of them have lost homes due to the wildfires. I'd like to thank the leadership and staff, the leadership of the staff, school districts, within fire-affected communities who are working tirelessly to support students and their communities. During this time, it is incredibly important that we all come together and look after one another. Wildfires can impact our mental health in vastly different ways. In the province, health authority, and other agencies are working to connect people to vital mental health services should they need them. If you need mental health supports or just want someone to talk to, please call the BC Mental Health Support Line for free at 310-6789. They are available to help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Additionally, youth aged 12 to 24 can access virtual supports on the BC Foundry app and Foundry Virtual at, B at the website is foundrybc.ca. So for clarity again, youth aged 12 to 24 can access virtual supports on the Foundry BC app and Foundry Virtual at foundrybc.ca. I cannot understate how important these tools are. If you need someone to talk to, please do not hesitate. Before I turn it over to Minister Ralston, I'd like to stress one more time that we are still in peak wildfire season. The rain that we experienced over the last couple of days has brought some relief in the south, but the wildfire season continues. People across the province, particularly in the north, must stay vigilant and be prepared to evacuate if needed. So please continue to be prepared. Have an emergency plan and a grab-and-go kit ready for you, your family, and your pets. Pre-register for emergency support services at ess.gov.bc.ca. Your First Nation or local authority will provide information on evacuation routes and evacuation reception centers where you can access emergency support services. And if you are under an evacuation order, you must leave the area immediately. This helps protect your community, your family, yourself, and first responders. Thank you. I'd like to now turn it over to Minister Ralston. Good 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Bruce Ralston, Minister of Forests. Uh, honored to, to be again today on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. Um, there are currently 422 wildfires burning across British Columbia. Twelve of those are what's called uh, fires of note. Those are fires that are especially visible or a threat to public safety. While the cooler, recent cooler temperatures have uh, been a welcome change from the heat we endured uh, earlier this month, uh, the BC Wildfire Service continues to work continuously to bring these fires under control. Milder weather and rain in the southern half of the province uh, will allow crews to make good progress in the coming days. Today, the northwest is braced for strong winds and the northeast is experiencing more hot and dry conditions. We have shifted some crews and aircraft to the, to the north in anticipation of this shift. Let me once again thank our brave fire personnel as well as our very welcome out-of-province personnel from Mexico, South Africa, Australia, Ontario, as well as from the Canadian Armed Forces. As we approach the final long weekend of the summer, I also want to remind everyone to continue to be cautious and vigilant. Though most wildfires during the summer months are lightning caused, the majority of wildfires that occur in shoulder seasons are caused by humans. We ask everyone to do their part in preventing human-caused fire starts by following all fire bans. Open burning, including campfires, is prohibited across most of BC, particularly as ongoing elevated drought conditions in much of British Columbia increase the potential for wildfires. In recognition of the dry, hot conditions uh, and elevated winds we have seen in the Northwest, Category 1 campfires will again be prohibited. You'll have to pay attention, and please do, to your local prohibitions and restrictions as regional weather will be variable as we transition into the fall. I'd like now to focus on drought conditions in British Columbia. In the south, I know many people have been relieved to see some rain in recent days. But the short-term rain we are seeing in the south does provide some relief, and areas that experienced rain last week and this week may see decreased decreases in their drought level. However, while these rains are welcome, at this stage they are not big enough, significant enough to change the trajectory of the ongoing drought conditions uh, here in the province. As Minister Ma mentioned, although we have seen some slight improvements in a few regions, the drought in many watersheds continues to slowly get worse and more severe. Right now, nearly 80% of British Columbia is at drought level 4 or 5. 5 is the most severe drought classification possible. Several factors have caused high-risk province-wide drought conditions this year, including less rain than usual over the last 12 months and the early snowmelt this past spring. At this point, we need several inches or more of rainfall over an extended period to help alleviate our drought conditions. However, significant rainfall doesn't typically come until the fall, meaning we can anticipate drought conditions to persist in the province for the next while. It is a serious uh, situation. It is likely that an increasing number of people, communities, First Nations, businesses, and wildfires, <coughs> wildlife will face challenges. That's why we're asking people to conserve water. Access to water by food producers is crucial for food security for all of us. Water supply is also vital for firefighting and for the operations of many services and businesses. We are working hard to make sure people have the water they need. Right now, there are four targeted temporary protection orders in places to help restore water flow <coughs> levels and protect the local fish populations. These orders do not impact, and I'm, let me repeat, do not impact water use for people's personal use, market vegetables, fruit trees, nor livestock. These decisions are made as an absolutely <coughs> last resort because we recognize the very real impact this has on farmers and businesses. 
Ahead of these orders, the Ministry of Forest sent letters describing the situation and asking water licensees in the area to conserve water voluntarily. In addition to letters to the licensees, public information meetings were held in affected areas. Ministry staff also met with local First Nations to collaborate and discuss drought response options. Since June 2023, Ministry staff have held biweekly drought meetings with representatives from local, provincial and federal governments to undertake a collaborative approach to BC's drought conditions. And if the current drought outlook continues, the province may need to issue additional fish population protection orders. We are doing this conservation work to preserve drinking water uh, and water for our food supply and the health of fish and animals. The province is stepping up to help farmers and ranchers which what, with what is a very tough summer. That's uh, understood and recognized. Many farmers are already seeing challenges from wildfires and drought, uh, and many stepped up to voluntarily conserve water. Because of the collective effort of our communities, we were able to delay the need for temporary protection orders. That's why we're working actively with the federal government for agri recovery funding to help disaster impacted producers recover and resume farming operations. And we will have more details on this support coming soon. As well, we're working to secure more feed for livestock through the Access to Feed program. We know that orders of this nature significantly impact water users, and we are continuously monitoring impacted waterways for rainfall and water flows. Thank you to everyone in British Columbia who has been voluntarily re reducing their water use and those who are adhering to the water restrictions and temporary protection orders. All of this makes a positive difference. Let me turn uh, this back to uh, Minister Moth. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. In addition to Minister Ralston and myself, we have on the line Cliff Chapman, Director of Provincial Operations with the BC Wildfire Service, Peter Brock, Executive Director of Regional Operations with the Ministry of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, Connie Chapman, Director of Man Water Management with the Ministry of Forests, Dave Campbell, Head of the River Forecast Centre, and Mark Raymond, Executive Director of the Agricultural Resource Division with the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. Um, happy to take some questions. As a reminder for reporters in the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. That's star 1. Raymond, Executive Director of the Agricultural Resource Division with the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. Um, happy to take some questions. Thank you. As a reminder for reporters in the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. That's star one to ask a question. For media in the room, please line up at the microphone provided and wait to be called. Please make sure to provide your full name and address. Media will be limited to one question and one follow-up. We will take questions from the media in the room first. Uh, our first question is from Apical Turner, CTV. Hi, my first question uh, is about the drought conditions. Um, what happens if we see another dry fall? Do we have plans in place? I know we're counting on rain this fall to kind of ease the drought conditions, but what happens if we don't see that rain? Uh, I'll start and then pass it over to, to Minister Ralston. We may engage uh, River Forecast Center or Connie Chapman um, to provide response as well. I will say that uh, this is, it is a concern for us that the drought season could last beyond this calendar year and into the following year. It is one of the reasons why we have been imploring communities and um, water users to take voluntary measures to conserve water now. It is a very serious situation that British Columbia has not faced before. Um, and it is absolutely necessary that people change their mindset about water here in British Columbia as a result of the impacts that we're seeing due to climate change. Um, Minister Ralston can uh, speak more specifically. 
Thank you very much. Um, as Minister Ma has said, the, the drought conditions in British Columbia are something that we have not uh, seen before. We're, of course, not alone in this drought conditions uh, in North America. Indeed, I was reading this morning that in India, they've had the least amount of rain in August uh, since 1901. So um, I, people will obviously see the connection to, uh, to climate change. Here in British Columbia, uh, we have uh, uh, a, a very well-developed internal uh, system of managing a drought and preparing for drought. Uh, and uh, the, the, the contingency plans that of, for events that you speak of, one hopes that they don't happen, uh, are, are, uh, are, are developed. So, um, but uh, I'll turn it over perhaps to uh, Peter Brock, who might uh, be able to add uh, a little bit more about the uh, operation of those uh, plans. Yeah, hi, Peter Brock, Executive Director for Provincial and Regional Operations for Emergency Management and Climate Readiness. So uh, should mention that we have been engaged with communities from the start, uh, early in the spring, discussing drought as a concern. Um, communities are aware of that concern. We've uh, worked together to try to implement tools that would better serve communities to work through the drought season. Uh, examples of some of those tools are uh, really encouraging and supporting communities and updating their uh, emergency uh, response scarcity or drought uh, plans uh, to ensure that they're better positioned to uh, look at restrictions and look at uh, public education campaigns to really support uh, that sort of unified effort uh, through all levels of government, both local and provincial, on trying to address drought. Um, we've looked at going into communities, uh, specifically working with them to help them with their emergency plans for drought and continue to uh, support and monitor their um, uh, requirements in that regard. Uh, so uh, maybe just to take on to the minister's comments there, we do take drought very seriously. Uh, we are not out of the woods yet. And so we'll remain vigilant and continue to provide those supports. Uh, thank you. We, we also have uh, Connie Chapman, who's uh, the acting director of the water management branch, perhaps uh, if, uh, you wish to add any further comments, Connie, please go ahead. Thank you, Minister Ralston. Just to add into the space is that, as Minister Ralston has said, drought is serious and so is Peter. We will continue to monitor it throughout the fall and into the winter and um, action will continue to occur throughout the entire season um, in regards to preparation for the next um, real drought season that, that normally starts after fresh up. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have the environment minister? Did he call in George uh, Heyman? Is he on the line? He's not? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this can be answered then. It's about the Joffrey Lake situation. Um, is anyone able to comment on that situation? If I, I don't have a, an answer. I'm aware of the situation that you mentioned. You're right. It does fall within the jurisdiction of the minister of the environment. A week we can... Uh, follow up with you uh, and get you a more detailed answer on that question. Thank you. We are going to take questions from the line now. Uh, we have Keith Baldurdi from Gobal. Go ahead, Keith. Hi. Uh, so the focus of the briefing seems to be more on drought than fire, so I'll ask on that. The New York Times in the last few days just published a huge investigative piece on the groundwater situation, particularly in the western United States, and found alarmingly low um, aquifers and groundwater more is coming is being taken out than is going in i'm just wondering how be and minister Olson, you mentioned this is not a bc province it's everywhere india and the rest of north america how does bc's drought situation compare to say the western united states which seems to be in a very perilous situation thank you let, let me just give a, a, a beginning of an answer and then i'll perhaps turn it over to connie chapman the, the reason for passing the Water Sustainability Act, and uh, it worked its way through the legislature and became uh, uh, a law in 2016, uh, was to, uh, and uh, many of the provisions have uh, taken some time to be proclaimed in force, but are now in force, was uh, a forward-looking view about water management and the prospects of drought into the future. So uh, I th we have... a. A, a, a good, a strong legislative flame, framework to uh, to deal with the challenges. One of the aspects of the Water Sustainability um, Act is the requirement 
for those people who access uh, aquifers um, wet by, by means of wells and other methods uh, to register so that there can be a, a detailed inventory uh, for, for future management purposes. And that's one of the principal purposes uh, of the Act. And uh, we've had some success in uh, encouraging people to, uh, to register, and that enables a further, big, bigger profile of the aquifers uh, in British Columbia for future planning. But perhaps at this point then, uh, in terms of any detail about where or how British Columbia might compare with the Western United States, uh, uh, I'll turn it over to Connie Chapman if she's able to uh, add anything further on that point. Thank you, Minister Ralston. Um, so just to start, you know, BC has taken a proactive approach in regards to mapping aquifers as best as possible with the relevant data that is currently at hand and looking at future monitoring um, opportunities within that space. We do have the groundwater monitoring well system in which the aquifers are uh, monitored on a regular basis to look for those changes. I think one thing that we need to keep in mind is that uh, most things in nature are connected. So our aquifers are connected to our streams and they're connected within the watersheds to each other. And so is the hydrologic cycle. And so what we have to be cognizant of is that um, water, water flows and changes movement between aquifers and streams and is really reliant on that recharge from our rainfall. And that rainfall, as we are currently seeing, we haven't had much of it over the last 12 months, as Minister Olson said. And so often we see patterns throughout areas where if one area is uh, seeing that sort of pattern, we may also see it. And so this is where that vigilance comes in in regards to um, monitoring uh, the systems that we have in place, but also with some of that behavioral change in regards to how we view and utilize um, the water within the province and uh, enacting the Water Sustainability Act to show that good stewardship of the, the resource. Thank you. Keith, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, if I recall, when the Water Sustainability Act worked its way through the legislature, some of the concerns voiced at the time were, were there gonna be enough resources allocated to make sure this act functioned in the way it was designed. So the minister mentioned uh, registration, for example. Is there is there evidence that there's a lot of uptake and voluntary registration? And is there any enforcement powers being contemplated going forward if the situation seems to be you know deteriorating so rapidly? Um, I'll, uh, let me let me begin an answer, and then I'll ask Connie to give the specific statistics. Um, I think we've been very fortunate in that many people in the province recognize uh, the importance of water and the need to uh, follow the, the uh, regulation that's been put in place to register uh, their groundwater use. Um, there, it has been a work in progress. Uh, the, initially, the uh, regulation that required registration was uh, delayed uh, three years from uh, uh, 2016 to 2019, and then a delayed a further three years. There's been a widespread uh, notice and consultation, whether it's with community groups, whether uh, I think there's been a quarter of a million messages of various types through various uh, media advertisements, and in some cases in um, important water restricted areas or uh, drought prone areas, um, there's been personal visits uh, by uh, ministry staff to water users, encouraging them to register. So um, there are there are those who have yet to register, and we're optimistic that uh, the the circumstances now will encourage people to register. There are mechanisms for enforcement. That is an absolute last resort, um, um, but there are, there have been a, a, a few. Uh, uh, enforcement actions taking place uh, in the province, so very, very few, but uh, so far I think we've enjoyed the confidence of the public and the support of, pub of the public and recognizing that uh, the public view of water as an unlimited resource uh, in infinitely into the future has dramatically changed and will continue to change uh, as, uh, as the climate changes. So I, I, Connie may, uh, Chapman may wish to add to that. Thank you, Minister Ralston. So just building off what Minister Ralston said is we did see over the last six years, a number of individuals, 7,711 applications come in 
in regards to existing use groundwater, it's critical that we understand that usage to be able to um, have the understanding of what's going on in regards to withdrawal and demand within those watersheds. We are also seeing new use applications come in um, for new groundwater use. Um, these applications uh, provide a substantial amount of data in regards to well information, withdrawal information, and location, and helps in regards to that stewardship of the water resource throughout the province, but also for that future planning and the ability to um, understand the different cycles of how the water is used throughout. Uh, thank you. Our next question is from Jane Skripnik, Black Press. Go ahead, Jane. I think it's for me, Lauren Collins. I'm not sure. Um, my question, I think it's for uh, Minister Ralston and then Cliff Chapman, but as BC is possibly moving beyond the worst parts of the wildfire season and heading toward the end, how does that affect the BC Wildfire Service this year as the organization has moved into year-round operations? Let me begin and then I'll turn it over to Cliff. Um, certainly after every wildfire season, there is a, a, a process of uh, evaluation reflecting uh, upon uh, what took place during the season. And, and I want to add that the season is, is not over. There are several hundred uh, active wildfires in the province at this point. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to the end of the season. Uh, there will be that uh, internal review. Given that this has been a very, very tough season, uh, including uh, two uh, deaths of uh, firefighters. Um, it's one that will be scrutinized and, and reflected upon uh, in order to better plan for the following year. One thing that the government did in the last budget cycle was take the, uh, the core of BC Wilds Fire Service, which was uh, year round and dramatically expand uh, the number of full-time year-round people there. That's to assist in, uh, in planning uh, and developing responses uh, f uh, into the future. And that's something that uh, uh, took place uh, this year and uh, we'll reflect upon that and into the next budget cycle as well as to whether uh, that, that worked uh, in the way that we wanted or whether uh, there needs to be further changes there. But that's a matter that uh, uh, we'll take advice on from uh, the BC Wildfire Service and their evaluation of this year's uh, program. So maybe uh, I could turn it over now to Cliff Chapman. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for the question. I, I think, Minister, you've covered it, it quite well. I'll, I'll dive a little bit deeper into a couple pieces that we're, we're already starting to plan out what the fall is going to look like, specifically around really the other pillars of emergency management. So. We're, we're continuing and will continue to invest heavily into the prevention program, prevention and mitigation, whether that's fuel reduction work around communities. Uh, I think a, a significant increase in cultural and prescribed fire, trying to eliminate the fuels uh, both in the fall, but also as we transition into spring 2024, so that we have you know, more community protection utilizing fire in a time when we have more control over it, unlike uh, you know, the challenging conditions that we faced in July and August. The big one for me is recovery uh, and recovery really has two streams on it. There's the actual recovery of the land base uh, communities that have to obviously go through their recovery process with the devastating impacts of fires this season, uh, as well as where we've put, you know, machine guards in around all of these fires. I saw an estimate the other day somewhere in the neighborhood of 3000 kilometers of machine guards have been pushed by our organization this summer. We need to go and rehabilitate that land. We need to try to get it back to be whole again um, in some areas. In other areas, we'll leave them as strategic fuel breaks for next season and years to come. The other part of recovery that is super important to the organization is the human recovery. Uh, as Minister Ralston has mentioned, this fire season has been extremely heavy uh, for the public in BC, in a, as well as for BC Wildfire Service as an organization. We have not experienced some of the things that we have experienced this year and our organization, and I'm very proud of the people in it, they continue to show up. We're now turning the corner into September. Uh, we got a little bit of rain in the South, which I think is, is something to be celebrated uh, after a very challenging last four months. However, as we've heard on the briefing today, and I'll just go a little bit deeper, 
the north is not not getting rain they are not getting any rain in the next 48 hours what they are going to receive is significant winds and as we talked about at the last briefing there are some fires on the landscape up there that we were talking about on these media briefings back in april may and june um, as well as some additional fires over the last couple of months that are going to get that wind on them over the next 48 hours. And we are suspecting or we're forecasting those winds to be between 40 and 60 kilometers an hour. That's a significant wind after seven days of drying in the north. So I just don't want to lose focus on the fact that the north is not experiencing the same weather that we're experiencing in the south right now. Um, so I just wanted to get that out there. Additionally, in terms of the fall and, and all hazards and, and the continuation of our evolution as a service, uh, we will be, you know, making sure that our people are looked after, making sure they get the supports they need to reintegrate back to their base jobs, as well as making sure they're available and ready for potential deployments to other hazards that this province may need us for. Uh, it's something that we've been focusing on for the last 12 months trying to build that organizational structure that allows us to operate more holistically 12 months of the year. We're, we're on that path. We have availability. We did respond to some other hazards this spring, and we suspect that we may be asked to respond to some hazards this fall and as we go into the winter. So lots of work uh, underway. And, and again, uh, for us, big priority around recovery, both landscape recovery and, and human recovery, so that we are ready and able to respond to what comes next. Lauren, sorry about that. Um, do you have a follow-up? I do, yes. Earlier, um, Minister Ralston mentioned that in the shoulder season, the majority of wildfires are human-caused and ask the public to be careful. And then in the shoe swap, um, a number of community members have been taking training to help with the wildfire fight. How much is the province or BC Wildfire Service looking to engage the community in the coming months to both be better educated around wildfires and maybe even encouraging that training? Perhaps I can start on an answer there. Um, one of the things that BC Wildfire Service has developed uh, over the recent fire seasons, beginning in 2017, is, uh, is a different approach to community response to wildfires. Uh, and uh, there is a program uh, within the ministry, uh, the Community uh, Response uh, Network, um, where members of the public who want to help, who have expertise or equipment to offer are uh, given training uh, and uh, uh, learn uh, how to, they, they might uh, contribute by uh, fitting into the command structure of the overall fight against any particular wildfire. So certainly that's something that uh, the uh, service welcomes. Uh, it is a, an evolving uh, standard in the sense that uh, uh, each, each fire season brings new lessons and uh, and BC Wildfire Service, I would say, is a is a learning organization in the sense that they are responsive to uh, public concerns and and uh, evolve their uh, their response based on uh, on it, the experience of any individual season. So that's uh, certainly something that is uh, is taking place um, in terms of uh, um, the, uh, the the dis the difference between lightning starts and uh, and human starts that statistic. I'll, I'll get uh, uh, Cliff to answer in terms of uh, what's the basis of that uh, that study and uh, and how we might uh, better prepare in the in the months that stand uh, immediately in front of us. So Cliff, thank you, Minister. <laughs> I appreciate the question around uh, around the community's interest and, and the continuation of that interest as we go into uh, the non response months of fire season, which we're not there yet. I, I just stress that again, we're not there yet. But uh, first off, I just want to thank uh, all the communities that we've been present in uh, through the course of the last four months this fire season. We have been met generally speaking with very open arms. Uh, our staff feel appreciated in those communities. They feel appreciated when they have to go get gas or food or whatever it is they need to do in those local communities. We cannot do it without you. And we appreciate the support that's been there. On top of that, uh, and it was actually ahead of this fire season that we had started to explore additional response capacity for BC. 
That included a, a direct relationship with the Cattlemen's Association of BC, with First Nation Emergency Services Society to work with First Nation communities to stand up response resources. We have an industry agreement where we work with contractors to ensure that we have equipment that can be signed up as well as additional human capacity that are familiar with working in the forest and they're an amazing asset at understanding uh, what the fuel conditions are, what the terrain looks like, and they, they live and work in, in the forest. So, uh, And then on top of that, we had just kicked off what we're calling the Cooperative Community Response Project, which is a project that is essentially to bring on community members that are willing to take a very sort of low level of training or a basic level of training to ensure safety and general firefighting tactics. Uh, and then we can sign those community members up, ideally through a local fire department or local fire brigade, as we've seen in the Shushwap, as well as what we've seen on the Rossmore Lake fire uh, and other fires across the province. This is something that we know we need to and want to expand. We want to work with local governments. We want to work with fire departments across BC, as well as the general public that are willing and want to support response should their uh, communities see an impact from a wildfire in the future. So we're going to expand that program. We're going to look to put some some more parameters around it so that communities know how to how to access it and and what it's going to mean. Now, initially, we're talking about response, but those partnerships with the Cattlemen's First Nation Emergency Services industry and and many others that I'm not mentioning, that relationship is not just a response relationship. It is a relationship across the four pillars of emergency management as it pertains to fire. So we work together on preparedness. How many resources do we need where? How do we work together on that? Response, obviously, as we've seen, and we're continuing to learn and evolve. But in, importantly, also in prevention and mitigation, uh, cultural and prescribed fire is, is, can't be done alone. We want to do it in partnership with communities, First Nations, and local governments. Uh, and then as well with the recovery, whether, again, that's community recovery or landscape recovery. So. Partnerships is the way we need to move forward as it pertains to wildfire in this province. Uh, we will need to continue to work together to get to the best outcomes we can for the public of BC. Our next question is from Andrew McCloyd, the day. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, hi, question for Minister Ralston. Uh, you were talking about temporary fish protection orders earlier and you described them as a last resort. Uh, my understanding is the Water Sustainability Act also allows for making those decisions on curta curtailment through seniority, uh, what's known as the first in time, first in rights, or fit for uh, process. So, so I'm wondering why you went the fish protection order route instead of the fit for route. Thank you, uh, thank you, Andrew. The uh, first in time, first in right is well is a well established. Uh, legal principle for uh, water usage. Uh, it's basically as it sounds, if, uh, if you're the first uh, user to apply and you're licensed, uh, you get priority over subsequent registrants. Uh, and some of the water licenses uh, go back uh, decades, if not uh, many, many decades. So that, that principle is there. What the fish protection order section of the Water Sustainability Act gives authority to override the ordinary law there. It's an extraordinary uh, remedy. Um, and uh, that's the basis, the legal basis on which a fish protection order is made. So it, uh, it gives authority to override the, the, the way in which ordinarily water usage would be allocated. Uh, and uh, that's the, that's the the legal authority to do what is done. And do you have a follow-up? Um, yeah, absolutely. I understand that that's the, the legal authority for doing it. I guess it's the, 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 the question is, is why? Like, I, I, my understanding is, is it allows for people who are growing market vegetables or who are raising livestock to continue using water. Uh, and in particular, it, it means people who are raising forage crops have to stop. Um, so I guess what, I'm wondering what you would say to somebody who's growing forage crops who says, well, hey, we're part of the food chain as well. Why are you cutting our use? Uh, sometimes use, as you say, that, that goes back decades or even a century. Uh, why, why are you cutting that over uh, more recent users? Um, the, um, the process by which um, uh, the decision to issue a fish protection order 
uh, is made is, is a lengthy one. And indeed, at, uh, we're now, most of the water basins are at, as we've heard and we, we said, at level four and five. But typically, uh, in the process, at le when drought levels reach level three, um, staff engages with uh, the community and with water users to begin to uh, bring awareness of uh, that drought level and the prospect of that drought level increasing uh, and encourages voluntary use and voluntary reductions of water use. So there's a fairly, um, um, uh, I guess, a, a ladder of uh, engagement that takes place. And so um, th that, that that's begins the process. There are also, as you heard, uh, community level water committees that involve uh, municipalities, the federal government, First Nations, uh, uh, and industrial and uh, commercial users, and that would include uh, certainly farmers in that. So there, there is a process of engaging uh, people in that process. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, there is a science uh, which monitors uh, stream flow levels uh, and their impact upon fish. And it's only as a, as a last resort to uh, maintain uh, a stream flow level or river flow level that will uh, enable the fish population to survive uh, is there a consideration given to uh, the remedy of a fish protection order. So the uh, interests of agriculture are, ex are, ex are obviously expressly considered uh, and uh, that's uh, how the decision goes forward. So it's, uh, it's a fairly um, um, uh, generally, we've been able to achieve uh, uh, these results uh, without the need to move to orders, but the level of drought this year in, in some water basins has been completely unprecedented, and uh, that decision has uh, uh, been necessary. That's all the questions we have today. That concludes the availability. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining. Thank you.